Hilton branded hotel here. In late November, it was announced that a 90 million US dollars upscale Hilton branded hotel will be constructed at Houston Magdoom area on the east bank of Damarara. While the exact location of this second Hilton hotel is yet to be confirmed, the managing partner of Arsenac, Allen and Allen Business Practitioners, Gavin Allen, said the entire project will cost 100 million US dollars. Once construction begins, the project can be completed within 18 months. Allen, during a press conference on Thursday at his office in Sobrianville in Georgetown, said that Arsenac firm is still finalizing the location of the location with the government. He said his firm, which he described as a professional business services group, has been in talks with the government over the last three years. While the partners are still deciding to ensure the brand is aligned, Allen said that the Hilton project would likely see the hotel being given the name Hotel El Dorado and will fall under the One Embassy Suites brand. It's, it's going to be a landmark, we believe, iconic uh, piece of property. Uh, it's going to be between 17 to 21 floors. Uh, we believe we're going to cater for about 150 to 200 uh, vacancies, hotel vacancies. We'll also have about 90 executive suites and about two ultra uh, luxury suites. Uh, there's a possibility that we're going to attach helipads to that project. And we're, we're still looking to see, uh, from an engineering standpoint, how, how that would, would work. This project is going to run us approximately $100 million, uh, quite a significant amount of money. Uh, we do believe at the time of uh, construction, uh, we'll be able to employ somewhere in the vicinity of 400 to 500 local employees, uh, in addition to the subject matter experts and, and, and different disciplines that have come uh, to bring such such a project on board. Uh, at the time of opening, we, we estimate we'll, we'll hire about 300 local employees. Uh, we do believe that this, this property has the potential to be one of the additional economic drivers uh, in this country, allowing for world-class uh, business expats and other individuals looking to come back to Ghana. And promising to take residential housing on the Essequibo coast to the next level, a popular businessman on Wednesday launched a gated community at Windsor Castle called Jagsville. The proprietor, Tamish Jagmohan, said the project will commence shortly and will provide close to 200 house lots. Bibi Katoon reports. Jagsville at the Windsor Castle community on the Essequibo coast will be providing 171 house lots. During a south turning ceremony at the site of the gated community on Wednesday, General Manager Curtis Mathis said much needed jobs will be provided to residents of Essequibo. This housing project will create numerous jobs for the people of, of Essequibo during the construction phase. This is in addition to the 200 plus individuals that are currently being employed by the businesses that Mr. Jagmohan owns along the Essequibo coast. He hopes that he will be able to work hand in hand with the government to do this and several more projects that he has in mind. Businessman Tamish Jagmohan, who is undertaking the project, disclosed that the company has acquired the land some time ago. Approval was granted by the Central Housing and Planning Authority on December 10, 2020, to proceed with the development. From December 10 to now, we have mobilized our equipment, secure our raw materials, engage all the agencies necessary for this housing project. And we are days away from serious movements and action. Lots will range from 5,000 square foot to 43,560 square foot and will be completed with loans from the commercial banks in Essequibo. Under a public-private partnership arrangement, about 50% of the lots that will be available to the government. Also attending the event were Ministers of Housing and Water Colin Kroll and Susan Rodriguez. Minister Kroll lauded the project, noting that the government welcomes investment. It's a pleasure on behalf of our government. We welcome investment. We welcome investment by everyone. We just want to ensure that the, the main investors ensure that they keep their bond to the people within the region to the citizens, that we have good work, quality work, and of course, well, I'm aware of their timely manner. The minister said the government is also working on its own housing drive, through which Essequibo residents will see over 600 lots allocated in the coming year. During his visit, the minister also aided in distributing 91 land titles to residents in Region 2. 
PB Katon, Newsroom. We tell you now that High Court Judge Nareshwar Harninan on Thursday ruled that Ghana's president has the power to appoint members of the local bar to the dignity of senior counsel. The judge dismissed an application filed by attorney at law Timothy Jonas, which challenged four senior counsel appointments that were made by the former president David Granger last year. Justice Harnanan, while ruling on the case that was brought before him back in August 2020, said the appointments were made by the president is in no way an infringement on the independence of the judiciary. Following the ruling, President Irfan Ali officially presented instruments appointing senior counsel Anil Nandlal, Timothy Jonas and Jamila Ali. Kurt Campbell tells us more. Examining the historical context of how the executive came to have a role in appointing senior counsel, High Court Judge Narshwar Harnanan explained on Thursday that the once royal prerogative power was handed down from the Crown to the Governor General and then to the Executive President when Guyana became an independent country. He said there is a need for transparency in the nomination process for persons the President intends to confer with Silk. But the case brought before the court does not challenge the process, and as such, the ruling does not address that. This was supported by Timothy Jonas moments after he received his instrument of appointment as senior counsel from President Irfan Ali at State House. I would like to see a committee, I would say six, um, Chancellor, Chief Justice, a judge, three senior counsel, and the Attorney General are seven. Let them agree who to invite to apply, and then by majority, in a secret meeting, let them decide and let them make that proposal to the president. What happened before was that the judges were invited to submit names, but the names did not accord with what the judges submitted. And that shouldn't be. Some 22 persons were appointed senior counsel by former President David Granger between 2016 and 2019. But Jonas had only challenged the last batch of four made in December 2019. He said it was not an attack on the four persons. It was never an attack on four lawyers. What happened over five years is we saw a certain amount of arbitrariness, lack of transparency in what was done. Along with Jonas, Attorney General Alan Nandlal and Jamila Halley also received their instruments of appointment from the president. Dr. Ali said he believed the appointments were well-deserved and meritorious. I'm pleased as President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana to confer the title of Senior Counsel on three members of the legal profession. Mr. Mohabir Anil Nanlal, Mr. Timothy Monroe Jonas, and Ms. Jamila Ali. The record of excellence and sterling service exemplify the high standards of which the legal profession aspire. The conformment of senior counsel on these legal luminaries is meritorious and deserving. I congratulate them and wish them continued success in their careers. Nandlal, who was admitted to the local bar in 1998, was recognized for his support in drafting legislation and the advancement of Guyanese judicial prudence, while Jonas was recognized for his contribution to crafting public utility and labor laws after being admitted to the bar in 1996. Meanwhile, Ali, who was admitted to the bar in 1989, was recognized for her service as state counsel and senior legal advisor and her specialization in constitutional law and mediation. A security guard confesses to murdering a Commons Lodge woman after she refused to have sex with him. Relatives blame two Burbies hospitals for the death of their brother and a success squatter says hundreds were deceived by a lone woman with lofty dreams. Those and more when the newsroom returns. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. A 46-year-old security guard of 8th Street Commons Lodge has reportedly confessed to murdering 53-year-old Marlin Singh, known as Jean, whose naked body was found in her Commons Lodge bedroom on Friday, December 11. The suspect, Ravindra Ramdeen, was arrested on Thursday after a post-mortem revealed that Singh died as a result of manual strangulation compounded by blunt trauma to the head. He confessed to committing the heinous act because she refused to have sex. Isnella Patwa reports. 53-year-old Marlin Singh, called Jean, was last seen alive Thursday afternoon when she walked around the community of Cummins Lodge, East Coast, Demerara, to remind everyone that her birthday was in a few days. She was subsequently found naked and motionless in her bedroom by relatives on Friday last. A post-mortem on Wednesday revealed that she died as a result of manual strangulation compounded by blunt trauma to the head. Police Commander Assistant Commissioner Simon McBeam 
told the newsroom that the suspect, 46-year-old Ravinder Ramdeen, was intensely interrogated, after which he confessed that he committed a heinous act because Singh did not want to have sex with him. Ramdeen, in his alleged confession, claimed that he and Singh shared a relationship. He alleged that around 2130, on December 10th, he jumped the fence and entered the house via the back veranda with Singh's permission. Ramdeen claimed that Singh hit her head on the bed after they engaged in sexual intercourse. However, when he attempted to have sex with her again, she refused and as a result, he strangled her. Her father, Suraj Bali Singh, explained that he was in the lower flat of the two-story house when he heard Singh screaming the night before she was found dead. Me here on the, the, the screen, like, you know? Uh -huh. When me and the, the, the dogs, me and three dogs, uh -huh. so me, me call for Susie, I'm the girl. Jean, Jean, me not hear no nice. But they do, they do, they, they, this door they like, the back door. Me, you know, they buy, like, them dig thing or something, and anyway, then get in. To me, they get in, and after that, a morning, when me, go, well, me try get in there. I see Jean, Jean, they don't be so naked skin. So I call she, call she, call she, I see this girl dead. So then I start, you know, going to the people. Singh did domestic work and relatives also claimed that she was mentally challenged. Meanwhile, a neighbor and advocate against domestic violence and abuse, Madonna Ghani, also spoke with the newsroom and explained that Singh was reportedly brutally beaten by a relative two months ago. Singh made a report against the relative at the Torkine police station and had also taken up the matter in the courts. Thursday afternoon, she was telling me that her birthday is Sunday and um, she's coming for her gift. She was actually telling the entire neighborhood that her birthday is coming and she needs, she's going to go to everybody for her gift. She was healthy, she was strong, she was happy, you know, and to see that she's dead the next morning, it was very suspicious. I am... Um, on the police case because I want Miss Jean to have justice because the first time she didn't get justice. Um, tomorrow is the court hearing for her previous story, the beat story, and I will be at court to hear what's going on. Ghani said she intends to follow up with the investigation to ensure justice is served. The advocate also criticized the police for not taking the matter seriously during the initial investigation. It was only a few days ago that ranks from the Criminal Investigation Department, CID, took over the case and dusted for fingerprints. Neighbors have also been hosting a candlelight vigil for Singh every night since her death. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patwo. Now, relatives of a quarantine man are accusing doctors at the Port Morant and New Amsterdam Public Hospitals of negligence after he died on December 13. Feroz Talib told the newsroom that his brother, 50-year-old Amin Azad Talib of John's East Burbies Quarantine, first fell ill on December 3 and made several visits to the hospitals but was never admitted. Feroz said his brother was vomiting blood but was told by doctors at the Port Morant Hospital to go home and return to the New Amsterdam Hospital the following day. There, he was treated and told to return in the first week of January 2021 to complete some medical tests, but did not live to see that day. Relatives are disappointed that although Talib, Talib appeared to be an emergency case, he was not treated as such. So we decided to carry him at the Fort Brown Hospital. So when we carry him at the Fort Brown Hospital, then what they give the injection of saline, and then send him home back with an we don't in more just see like left whatever. When when people like to admit them. Now what what I try to say the difference when he come home back three o'clock in the morning, that's Sunday morning, three o'clock. And then he got to go back and down some hospital four o'clock Sunday morning. That is about four hour difference. Whereas poor Brown Hospital there was an ambulance there with a chauffeur. And then I met you so there, and that is an emergency. The neglect the boy. When when them take him down to the Amsterdam hospital, then give he I mean some injection or whatever. And they gave him a date till next month. The sixth and the eighth. If you do, do some blood tests with, with some MIR. Look at it, they have the facility there. 
Why is an emergency case? Why is that they don't make attempt to do it right? You don't have to give a man, the man actually vomit blood three weeks. Three weeks figured come and whereas poor Bank Hospital gave you an emergency we carry it. For admit and my mom walk with everything for the thing admit the bike. And when the bike come back, the same problem. And they get the people this from house to both hospital, Portman and Amsterdam. If the doctor both hospital, Portman and Amsterdam, could put more emphasis in this case with my brother, it, I believe Eli could have saved. And I want them to put things in place so that other people they can take it more seriously to look after other people because other people not me alone face this problem. Other people face this problem and they neglect it. And people are afraid to come speak to the media because why? They're being victimized. When they go to the hospital, they'll be victimized by the same doctor, by the same nurses. And what I'm saying, these people are trained professionals and if that's the way they behave it. You have the facility in the hospital, make use out of it. A senior health official in Region 6 confirmed that an investigation has been launched into the allegations. Additionally, the Director of Regional Health Services also visited the family to listen to their concerns. Following a post-mortem examination, it was concluded that Talib died due to multiple organ failure and cancer. The family did not know Talib had cancer and they believe he was unaware as well. He was laid to rest on Wednesday. At 62 years old, Carl Brown moved in as a squatter at a Success East Coast Demerara squatting area. He said things are relatively quiet in the area where just about 20 families remain, but more importantly, he tells the newsroom about how he and hundreds were duped by a single woman whom he identified. Brown said a woman sold lofty dreams and pretended to have the support of the government. Brown, like many others, moved into the area on the premise that the area would be regularized. This woman is a villain, she's a scamp. She is conducting a scam. And I think the government ought to put on her because she got systems. They went into the housing ministry where she sit on a computer and tell you if you're in the system or not. If you're not, she says she can put you in the system. And this is the thing that impressed me and lead me to wasting my money and my time, hoping for the government now to do something because I'm still in the area. When I was at Boulder Market, Saturday and I heard that the government is giving way land in success. We decided getting land I went they said I would have a meeting the following day, which would be the Sunday. So I went up, observed and got engaged due to a meeting that I witnessed one <laughs> conducted. Among the things that she said she said the government is only allocating one piece of land per person and the land would be 40 by 80 but she's trying to get it for at 50 by 100 and we'll have to pay two million dollars for the house lot but she's trying to get for to pay on in about five years time which will go up to about like forty thousand dollars a month which is reasonable she later did well conducting her speech. She said, at this location, we'll be having a police station. Around the corner, it will be a school. We'll have a health center. We'll have a church. So she had a plan for the area? She had a plan. You don't know where she got that plan from? I would say illusion because I can't imagine where she gets such a plan. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Everything seems to be legal because when I went, I saw police, I saw soldiers, I saw Supreme Ve Court vehicle, I saw people, ministries inside there. This is at the meeting? Yeah, at the meeting. But were they there in their professional capacity or they were also looking for, for Squatters, loss? everybody looking for this land. And at that stage, it was said it's no longer a squat. It's a so-called squat, but... The government is paying Nisel or guys to the land and giving the land to the people. Fortunate or unfortunate for me, I end up hearing a lot of rumors about the place and the illegality of the place. So I decided 
before I go forward in investing because I already built a shop. I said, let me just go to housing to find what is the position. When I went to housing, the first thing the people tell me, so says squat, we know going to take people up. <laughs> I said, what do you ask us this now? Something squintly, a few days later, a member of Nissel with the police came in. She wasn't there. And the squatters among myself, we started to protest. Everything was calm, calm, calm. The police had their distance, we had ours. All the blues came around. And she said, the lawyers are on the way, which brought joy to the people. And the people said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same night to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. The police reply, bow, bow, bow. Pellets and take gas. I got hit. She later, she took money, saying, we will not wait for the amount of time the government will take to put water on a proper bridge. We will dig a well and we will do our own water supply. Did she, did she dig the well? No, the well wasn't dig. But thanks to what, what for the purpose of water for the community. After the heat came on in the place, all the lumber, all the tanks that she has commi communicated with people to get their money, to buy these things, she put it on a canter and went away. She's now somewhere in the Timiri area conducting the same thing. This is hazardous. This is dangerous. This is chaotic. Because she's taking, making poor people invest their money, creating a war between the government and these squatters while she inherited the suite. As of now, the place is dead. They maybe got about 20 people in the area. And how much was there before? Um, your estimation? About two to three thousand. Mm. And only twenty remaining? About that. Where did the others go? Wow, crazy girl. That's crazy girl. Because I can't understand everybody stood up and fight. When it's all peace and quietness, no one is there except we who are there. It means that these people only wanted to work with the government now they got peace they wanted. Still ahead on the newsroom, 20 imported cases of COVID-19 reported since the airports reopened and the city mayor wants funds diverted from All Boys Town to complete the repairs on the Kitty Market. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. Since the reopening of the Chattijagan International Airport and the Eugene F. Karai International Airport on October 12, there have been 20 reported imported cases of COVID-19. The Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, revealed on Thursday during the daily COVID-19 update. Passengers who were in close proximity to those who tested positive were also contacted by the ministry and asked to self-isolate or self-quarantine. Passengers who provided a negative PCR COVID-19 test, which was done within four to seven days upon their arrival here, have to undergo another test at the airports when they land. We have had, um, since we have reopened the airport, we have had 20 imported cases and um, we have reached out to those persons. Uh, we have told them they are positive. Uh, we have explained to them the measures that they need to take and we have been monitoring them. So we are going to continue to do that. In addition to those passengers who have tested positive, uh, we would normally reach out to the persons who sat next to them, like the rows in front, side, at the back, uh, because these uh, other passengers would have been in clo close proximity uh, to the infected person and would have been, you know, for a number of hours. So the, the possibility of spread is there. So for those other passengers, uh, when we reach out to them, uh, we are trying to get them to quarantine themselves uh, so, so as to look to see whether or not uh, there's a, the development of the infection, um, you know, with them. So it's a, it's a process, but so far we've had 20 imported cases. 
A payment of 85 US dollars or 17,760 Ghana dollars is required for the COVID-19 test at the airports. The airlines currently operating here are Caribbean, Eastern, American, Copa and JetBlue Airlines. Now, the city mayor, Obraj Narain, is advocating for the transfer of $5.2 million to complete the Kitty Market Rehabilitation Project. But this money is already set aside to develop the All Boys Town Market. At a press conference on Wednesday, Mayor Narain explained that the works to be done at All Boys Town will cost more than the $5.2 million allocated since there is no steady structure there. There are some works to be done on Kitty Market on the phase two, especially at um, the phase two the where you have the, the fish pond. I believe that we no longer want it to be, let it be a um, one story. We want it a two story so you can accommodate more vendors in a more um, decent way so that people can go and shop there. And you know, I believe that five point something million will be able to do good for Kitty Market. And, and, and this I'm not showing our, our biasness on Kitty Market. Uh, we didn't, um, my party, the coalition didn't win Kitty, Kitty constituency. There's a PPP councillor there. And I'm argued with the minister. I, I, I said to the minister, look, divorce this money to Kitty Market. Kitty Market really in need of completion. So that those vendors on the road can be able to get their styles and get things going. Why Albaistong? We got enough work to do there. We need a holistic plan for Albaistong. When you speak on development, Albaistong market should be something, a three-story something there. Have an uh, office complex um, that where people can operate different businesses. Works began on the Kitty Market in 2016 by the Mayor and City Council, but was delayed after the Council experienced constraints. In 2018, $50 million was dedicated by the Council for works on the market, but to date, the facility remains incomplete and vendors are forced to apply their trade on the roadside. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a look at what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some football news. The former Golden Jaguars captain Christopher Nurse is happy that some level of resolution has come out of the controversial switch in home venue when Guyana clashed with Mexico in the 2014 FIFA World Cup qualifier. Akim Green spoke to the midfielder and filed this report. The highly anticipated fixture which is slated to occur on local soil during 2012 at the National Stadium Providence on October 12th was controversially switched by the Federation to Houston, Texas in the United States of America. It was initially mooted to be staged at the University of Phoenix in Arizona prior to the ultimate venue. It is understood prior to the match the players negotiated to be rewarded a certain percentage, but that did not occur. On December 10, via media release, the Ghana Football Federation stated it has commenced one-off payments of US $500 the national team players and staff assigned to the 2014 FIFA World Cup home qualifier against Mexico following an in-depth and independent investigation into the matter. Nurse indicated that while the sum is not marginally close to the expectation, one is still grateful. I think if everybody looks at the magnitude of the occasion, the game versus Mexico and the stage, I think anybody in the right mind who understands the game will realize that $500 is nothing in this cup of football, but something is better than nothing. The former captain revealed there was a possibility of the Federation benefiting from around US $500,000 had they operated in a more proactive manner. The, the robbery as such was obviously to the Guyanese public because being able to bring a team like Mexico into Guyana and you know, fill the stadium and bring the atmosphere and the experience for the fans is something that was taken away from them. But from a business perspective, you know, the, the figures that were being thrown around at the time were in, a, in excess of half a million US dollars that the Federation could have capitalized on had things been done in a more proactive and timely fashion. You know, they're talking about the game was to be played at 66,000 seat of stadium and given enough time to market the game fully, you can imagine the kind of revenue that that would have generated. 
And then the money, the, the, the kind of investment that could have been put into the infrastructure of football in Ghana with half a million dollars would have been incredible, you know? The, the, the local players now, you know, we wouldn't be going through periods of where they're very stagnant and not playing and facilities, you know, we would have had a, a huge, you know, cushion to develop football in Ghana. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And we, we sold the game in the end for reportedly a measly 75,000 US dollars when you look at the biggest scale of football. That's not very much at all for a game of that magnitude. At the 2019 Congress, the GFF stated the independent investigation into the switch qualifier didn't discover any evidence of criminal misconduct by the then executive committee. In the grand scheme of things, Nora said the biggest reward will be seeing the family of former goalkeeper Colin Edwards being rewarded. A 21 year old passed away following a motorcycle accident in February 2013. For me, the best thing, and I hope somebody can catch at the moment on camera um, is when Colin Edwards' family is going to be able to receive you know, a, a monetary um, gift as a result of the hard work he did when he was here with us. You know, We all know Colin Edwards left us a long time ago and that's one of the reasons I've been fighting for this because there's players here who cannot fight for it anymore. And the fact that his family now are going to be able to receive some money for the hard work and what he achieved when he was here with us, for me, that is one of the, the biggest blessings to come out of this whole thing. You know, that's the, that's the most positive thing for me that's going to come out of this. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Cricket news now, Guyanese trio Trevon Griffith, Ashmead Ned and Devendra Bishu combined to give 22 yards their first win of the U.S. Open T20 tournament on Wednesday at the Central Broward Regional Park. They defeated Afghan Zwanan by seven wickets after their opening day loss to Atlanta Paramvirs by six wickets. Afghan Zwanan batted first and posted 102 all out in 19.4 overs with opener Cody Chetty being the only player to get into double figures with 51 of 58. The Guyana Amazon Warriors signing Jasdeep Singh was the pick of the bowlers with 3 for 16, while Bishu 2 for 16 and Ned 2 for 26 were miserly in their four over spells. In reply, 22 yards coasted the victory at 103 for 3 with as many as six overs to spare with the left-handed Griffith, a former Guyana senior opener, batting to the end on 50 not out of 38 balls. In the other games on day two, Brampton Pacers remain unbeaten with a four-run four win over Atlanta Paramvirs and U.S. All-Stars inflicted a nine-wicket defeat on Punjab Blues. Back to football news, if teams don't get adequate time to prepare for the impending CONCACAF competitions during 2021, then they could be at a disadvantage. That's the word from CONCACAF's senior projects manager, that's Howard McIntosh. While football, that's competitive football and training, have resumed in some countries, Guyana, for example, is yet to commence formal training. Guyana's Golden Jaguars are down to compete in the CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers and the CONCACAF Gold Cup prelims during the first half of 2021. Here's what McIntosh had to say on the issue. Uh, a concern, maybe a small one, in all honesty, because uh, football is being played in most parts of the, the world now. Uh, and also in other parts of Africa, where most of the leagues have actually resumed. Uh, if, if the situation continues in terms of the football not resuming and the leagues not being played, then some of us, some of the countries will be at a disadvantage relative to the other uh, countries that will be participating in the Gold Cup for example, and World Cup qualifiers. So there's a little concern, but of course the major and priority concern now is life and is health. And therefore we understand, we understand what has to happen and the delicate balance between uh, life and life goods and, and what must happen in terms of sport. But we just ask that uh, everyone give due consideration to, to what is happening and does what is best in the interest of, of everyone. We're not asking for football to be given extraordinary consideration, just given the consideration sufficient to allow it to continue to produce and um, the, the, the boys and girls and, and, and types of players and also to continue to play its role in terms of developing the social fabric, and in this case, Kaya. 
Now, Captain Virat Kohli was run out for 74 as India lost three late wickets on the first day of the opening test against Australia. Kohli held the tourists recover from 32 for two, but they slipped from 188 for three to 206 for six before closing on 233 for six in a day-night match in Adelaide. Kohli, who will miss the final three test matches because of the birth of his first child, was dismissed after a mix-up with Ajinka Rahane. India lost three wickets in 6.3 overs, tilting the balance of the first day in Australia's favour. After Kohli and Rahane shared a solid stand of 88, Vice-Captain Rahane drove to Josh Hazelwood at mid-off, called for a single and then sent Kohli back. The skipper was well short of the ground when Nathan Lyon removed the bails. Mitchell Stark has so far taken 2 for 49 for Australia. And Pakistan pays bowler Mohammed Amir says he has retired from international cricket because he has been uh, mentally tortured by the team management. The 28-year-old who retired from test matches in 2019 was left out of the squad for the current tour of New Zealand. Amir played 146 games for Pakistan across all three formats after making his debut as a 17-year-old in 2009. He was one of three Pakistan players jailed in 2011 for a plot to bowl no balls in a test match against England and served a five-year ban for spot fixing. Amir took 119 wickets at an average of 30.47 in 36 test matches, 81 wickets at 29.62 in 61 ODIs and 59 wickets at 21.4 in 50 T20 internationals. And finally, in sport, Formula One's governing body, the FIA, has confirmed the calendar for the longest season in history next year. There will be 23 Grands Prix held next year, uh, next year, starting in Australia on March 21 and ending in Abu Dhabi on December 6. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone will be on July 18, and the Brazilian Grand Prix has been firmed up at the Sao Paulo's historic Interlagos circuit on November 14. The calendar is dependent on no further coronavirus pandemic disruption. F1 has said it is confident it will be able to run a full calendar. Plans for the Australian Grand Prix in Melbourne to be held at, in an F1 biosphere are already on the way. The date previously allocated for the Vietnamese GP, that's 25th of April, is still empty pending a host country being found. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.